work problem. You know, if you've got one that works and you know why it works and you've got kind of a template, then, um, then you can adapt that for the homework assignment. And I didn't want to just give you the full working spreadsheet because then you wouldn't get the experience of setting it up yourself. But with this, you've got every step along the way to see uh, whether what you're setting up is correct. And of course, as always, I'll invite you to uh, check with me if you have questions. And I really do enjoy troubleshooting these spreadsheets when there's some mistake, you can't figure out what's going wrong. If your solution isn't converging, then let me uh, help you with that. So um, yeah, these my solution is based on this initial guess flow rates. But even if you had different flow rates as your initial guess, it should converge so that the, uh, the final uh, ending flow rates is the same. So here in the fourth iteration, even if you had different initial guesses, you'll have the same flow rates at the end. So the last part of this example that we hadn't solved yet was how to calculate the pressure at each junction. What we had done is we had seen what is the flow rate through each pipe. So here is the final flow rates, and you can see that I've sketched the flow directions. And we checked the continuity at each junction to make sure that flow in and flow out are equal, and they are. So everything's working good on this. All we want to do now is find out what is the pressure at all these junctions. You can see from the given that we know the pressure at junction A is 600 kilopascals. And so if the pressure there is known to be 600 kilopascals, then the head is just going to be the pressure divided by 9.81 kilonewtons per cubic meter, which is the unit weight of water. So there's 61.162 meters of head at that location. Now, over here in the fourth iteration, I'm going to add a new column where I calculate the pipe head loss. So in meters, how much head loss due to pipe friction is occurring through pipe AB? Um, and the way that we do that is that we can find out the flow rate and multiply that by R times the flow rate to the N power. And so the head loss, let me just put this in bold. These are our flow rates in terms of a cubic meters per second. And so the head loss through the pipe is going to be R. And let's see, which column was my R values in? That is column I. So here's all of my R values. I'll just bold them so that they're easier to see. So the head loss through the pipe is R times Q squared. So for instance, through pipe AB, there's 3.48. 3.49 meters of head loss. And I can drag that down so that it's telling me through each pipe how much head loss there is based on the flow rate through the pipe and the R value that's there. All right, so here at junction A, there's 61 meters of head. Now look at junction B. It's downstream of junction A. So the pressure, I'm sorry, the head at junction B is however much head there was at A minus the loss through pipe AB. So do you understand why it's going to have less head at B? It's because it's downstream. And that's, you know, the water wouldn't be going from A to B if there wasn't less energy at B. So how much energy is there at B? There's how much energy there was at A minus the losses through the pipe. So I said it's the head at A minus, now I'll do this, because that is my head loss through pipe AB. So that is how much head there is at junction B. I'm going to go through and calculate all of the heads, and then I'll determine the pressures as well. Okay, so the head at C. So I know how much head there is at B, but should I add or subtract? Well, if I go from B towards C, I'm going upstream. So that must mean that there's more energy at C. Otherwise, the water wouldn't be going from C towards B. So the head at C is however much head there is at B plus the losses through that pipe. So I'm going to look for where is the BC. So plus 
there's very little loss through that pipe because there's very little flow going through BC. So it's almost the same. You can see there's a thousandth of a meter difference in the head. Okay. Now what about D? Okay, so the head at D is however much head there is at C plus the losses through CD. Because again, we're going against the flow, then we add the losses. So CD, here's our head loss. Okay, um, so E, if we want to know the head at E, we say it's however much head there is at C minus the loss through that pipe, CE. So the head at E is this amount of head minus the loss through CE. Okay, and then finally junction F. We have a couple of different things we could do to get the, the head at F. We could either say it's the head at A minus this loss through AF, or we could say it's the head at E plus the losses through EF. Because we know the head at both A and E. Or we could do it from D even. We could say it's the head at D minus the losses through DF. And regardless of which route we chose, remember the whole point of this Hardy Cross method is to make sure that there's energy balance so that regardless of the route we take, we have the same uh, beginning and ending energy when there are points that are connected by multiple routes. So I'm just going to say the head at F is uh, the head at E plus the loss through EF. All right. So then if we know the heads and want the pressure, pressure is the head times 9.81 kilonewtons per cubic meter. So then we've got the pressure at each of those junctions. And let's see if that matches up with what's on our large printout there. I think it does. Yeah. Your homework assignment takes it to the next level because I tell you the elevation at these junctions. In the example that we've just worked on right now, we assumed that all of these were at the same height. So in other words, on this example we just worked, we assumed that head is pressure divided by gamma. Um, if all z is same. But if it's not, if some of the z's are different, you know, like if part of the town is at a high elevation and part of the town is a low elevation, in a case like that, then head is the pressure head and the elevation head. So in your assignment, you're just going to have to take into account what's the elevation of the different locations so that when you calculate the pressure, you're subtracting out the elevation component of it. All right. Any questions about this before we move on? And by the way, if you do have like a, an issue with your particular spreadsheet, please let me know if I can help because uh, I'd be delighted to do that. All right. Well, if there aren't any questions, let's talk about Water Hammer. And we're going to watch a video. It's kind of an old timey video. It's from the 80s. All the best stuff's from the 80s, including this video. But it really effectively explains what water hammer is and kind of gives you an idea on why water hammer is important. Why, why it matters. Why I say written. And I've been working. Oh boy. All right. So let's talk about water hammer. To predict how much the pressure could increase, uh, there are formulas we can go through to calculate both how much the pressure goes up, and also how quickly the shock wave will arrive at a certain location. So we'll just go through a step-by-step -step description of what causes the water hammer and some of the parameters that apply here. So uh, the first step is that water is flowing freely. So you can see here is a tank of water. We've got a pipe coming from the tank, and there's a certain velocity of flow through the pipe. Now this is our energy grade line. Um, and you can see that if it was horizontal, 
the, the energy grade line would be horizontal if there was zero flow through the pipe, but there's energy loss as the water's flowing through the pipe, and so there is um, both a velocity head. Here, this, here's the hydraulic grade line. The larger dashed line underneath it is the hydraulic grade line, and so then the gap between the hydraulic grade line and the energy grade line is the velocity head. But the important thing to, to think here so far is the valve is open. The water's flowing through the pipe. And then if we just consider a certain control volume, we're going to keep track of what's happening to the flow in and the flow out through that control volume. And right now, the flow in and the flow out is equal. As long as that valve is open, there's no difference or discrepancy between the inflow and the outflow in this control volume. But remember, the water has momentum as it's moving through the pipe. And what we could use as the momentum equation, back from fluid mechanics in chapter 6, we talked about fluid momentum. And uh, the sum of the forces that can be imparted by a flowing fluid are equal to the density of the fluid, the flow rate, and so Together, density times flow rate, remember, is m dot mass flow rate. So if we're describing how many kilograms per second is going through this control volume, then the force that is going to be imparted by the fluid would be the difference between the outflow and the inflow. And right now, as long as the water is flowing freely, the velocity out and the velocity in is the same. So there's no shock wave yet. You know, they talked about it as a hammer, you know, like, 100 pounds of water is flowing through this and it's suddenly stopped, it's going to like hit that valve with the force of a 100 pound hammer. But so far it's flowing freely until the valve is suddenly closed. And so when the valve is suddenly closed, what happens is, think about this control volume. The water that's close to the valve stops before the water that's further away. It's not instantaneous because water is just a little bit compressible. It's not very compressible at all, but it's a little bit compressible. And so the water that's close to the valve stops before the water that is further from the valve. And that causes an acceleration. It's decreasing its velocity and a difference between the outflow and the inflow. So the water that's flowing out towards the right, that may be zero, but there's still water flowing in. And so now this little dashed line by the pipe, what they're representing there is that the pipe begins to expand. It's swelling up because of the increase in pressure. I remember in that video we just watched, they said the increase in pressure could be 600 PSI. And that may not be enough for a pipe to break, but it is enough for the pipe to swell. And so we can uh, quantify how easily pipes swell by looking at the modulus of elasticity for the material that the pipe is made out of. So there are these material properties. And you know, steel pipe will have one modulus of elasticity. Uh, lead pipe, which is softer and more flexible, would have a lower modulus of elasticity. But depending on what the pipe is made out of, it's going to swell a little bit because of the increase in pressure that occurs, that occurs um, from the, uh, the shock wave and the accumulation of pressure. Now, here C, that's talking about the speed at which the shock wave is working its way from the valve back towards the tank. Uh, that's called the speed of celerity. And that's, we've got an equation that can allow us to calculate how quickly the shock wave is moving through the pipe. Um, we're still just thinking about things in kind of qualitative terms. So right now, the valve has just barely been closed, and there's this shock wave that's moving backwards through the pipe. Um, and because of the, uh, the compressibility of water and the pipe being a little bit elastic is, in large part, why this whole thing is, is occurring. Because the water stops in the proximity of the valve before the water a little bit further away stops, and so it's kind of piling up temporarily. And all of the momentum of that moving water is exchanged to a localized increase in pressure. OK, so at a certain point, the shock wave makes it all the way back to the tank. So the wave reaches the reservoir. And then at that point, the water velocity has stopped. Because in this intermediate point, 
the velocity was zero near the pipe, but there was still water moving to the right for a, for a very short period of time after the valve was suddenly closed. Some of the water still moving to the right, but at a certain point we get to where all of the water is stopped, uh, the pipe has expanded, because, because of the pipe expanding, there's actually more energy in the pipe than there is in the reservoir. So here you can see the delta H is above the water surface. And that just means that there's some stored energy inside of the pipe. And so what's going to happen because of that, remember it's swelled, is the pipe is going to contract, just like a rubber band. You know, if you pull a rubber band apart and then you let go, it contracts again. And so there's no more accumulation of pressure inside of the pipe it's just it's a pipe that's artificially expanded and so what happens then is that the pipe begins to contract and then water flows from the pipe back into the reservoir and that causes a reflection of the wave and so the shock wave that got from the valve to the reservoir is now going back to the valve again and it can cause a process of wave reflection where depending on how long the pipe is and how quickly the valve is closed, you can slam a valve closed and the shock wave will go to the reservoir, back to the valve, to the reservoir again, back to the valve, and it can take several cycles before it finally dissipates uh, because you know the pipe is expanding, contracting, expanding, contracting, and each time it does it loses a little bit of energy, but that round trip between the valve and the reservoir and back to the valve can happen several times and that water hammer can be really destructive. And if not destructive, it can be annoying. People experience this in their houses where sometimes washing machines that have quick open and close valves to meter uh, water into the clothes washer or sometimes dishwashers can cause a water hammer and people hear like a pounding in the pipes and it's this, this effective water hammer. So let's talk about some of the parameters that go into the equations we're going to look at. Um, one of them is the bulk modulus of elasticity for water. And the bulk modulus of elasticity describes how easily water can be compressed. And so it's a, uh, a parameter that expresses the unit decrease in volume for uh, increase in pressure. And so here, this first term, minus V, that's volume, specific volume. So the specific volume is the volume relative to itself. Uh, so if we had, um, you know, one liter of water, what we're effectively trying to figure out is for a certain increase in pressure, like one pe if you increase the pressure on the water by one pascal, then how much of the volume decreases? And water is not very compressible, so we have to have really, really high uh, pressures to be able to, uh, to see an appreciable decrease in volume. Um, here we've got a table of both the bulk modulus in terms of pounds per square inch, and then in the book, your textbook, it has the bulk modulus uh, in terms of uh, pascals times 10 to the ninth. And by the way, in your textbook, that table 2.3 has an error. It uh, should be multiply, not divide, to get the units that are there. Um, so 10 to the 9th, uh, really high pressures for just a, a modest decrease in the volume. Um, so water's not very compressible, but it isn't compressible enough that it causes this um, water hammer. Um, and the damage that it can cause. So celerity is the speed of the shock wave moving through water. You've heard of the speed of sound before, right? So the speed of sound, people usually think about that as how quickly sound moves through air. Celerity is the speed of a wave of energy moving through water. And theoretically, if you have uh, water in all directions, an infinite extent of water, then the speed that a shock wave is able to move through water, uh, C prime, is related to the bulk modulus of elasticity for water divided by the density and then the square root of that. So it's about um, one and a half kilometers per second is how quickly energy can move through the water. But 
energy shock waves moves through water at a different speed if it's confined in a pipe. So if you have an elastic pipe, you have to take that theoretical celerity and modify it according to both the pipe parameters and also the physical properties of the water itself. So if you look at how we convert the theoretical celerity to the celerity in a confined pipe, then it's taking into account here in the denominator both the bulk modulus of elasticity for water, the diameter of the pipe, and then the thickness of the pipe walls. So if we're talking about you know, a two inch pipe, we'd need to know what's the thickness of the pipe walls and then also what's the modulus of elasticity for the material that the pipe itself is made out of. And so, you know, we can have pipes that's made out of copper or lead or steel or cast iron. And so we need to look up the modulus of elasticity for those pipe materials. And that's going to go into uh, how quickly the, the shock wave moves through the pipe of that material. Now, I mentioned that a shock wave makes a round trip that the shock wave starts at the valve and it goes back to a tank and then returns to the valve again. And so that's what we're interested in because that's the critical time parameter that tells us how slowly the valve should be closed. Remember that the video began by saying that the, the water hammer occurs when a valve is closed too quickly. Well, that sounds a little subjective, too quickly. Like, how quickly is too quickly? Well, this, we can calculate how long you should take to close the valve. And if you take that long, then you'll avoid the water hammer. And so you can avoid the water hammer if you take at least this minimum travel time. And so the travel time would be twice the length of the pipe, because it's going to the tank and back, divided by the celerity. So the speed that the shock wave is moving through the fluid. And the worst case scenario is if you close the valve faster than this critical time, then you'd observe the maximum surge pressure. But then if you close the valve in less than this time, then this formula can be used to calculate the increase in pressure that would be seen. So it's, we'll, we'll, we'll come to this in a bit. Let's use this information, so both Let's use how we calculate celerity and the travel time and the pressure increase to address the question of if we have this 2,000 foot long pipe, and so 2,000 feet is the physical length L, and the 4 inch diameter is talking about D that we're going to have to use here when we calculate the celerity of the pipe, D is 4 inches. And epsilon, the thickness of the pipe, 0.2 inches. We know the, uh, the bulk modulus of the pipe. And then the flow rate it's carrying is 0.6 cubic feet per second of water. And what we know about the water is both the bulk modulus of elasticity and the density of the water, 1.94 slugs per cubic foot. So let's go through the process of finding out how much is the pressure going to increase if we close the valve instantaneously, meaning in less time than this T sub L. And you have to do that by um, calculating, I think, starting here on the left. If we calculate the velocity of the flow, that will be useful later on down the line. Calculate the celerity. Uh, the theoretical celerity, then the actual celerity inside the pipe environment, and then we can calculate the uh, change in pressure. And I, just in case you've uh, forgotten the, the slugs, because we have the density of water here in slugs, um, a slug times a foot per second squared is a pound of force. So, I mean, the reason why I mention that is just to reinforce that um, when we're calculating this water hammer, you can use the pounds in the numerator and the slugs in the denominator and we're going to get out of this C prime feet per second. But the pressure that we have for the bulk modulus for the water, let's see it tells us the bulk modulus for the water is 320,000 pounds per square inch. You'll need to calculate E sub V 
put it in units of pounds per square foot. So you've got it in pounds per square inch. We want to know pounds per square foot before you substitute it into this formula. All right, so I'm going to pause for a second. I've got these calculations, and uh, I'd like you to go through and try and estimate each one of these properties. Let me just mention one thing about units conversion on this problem. So I suggested that when you're calculating C prime, you need to determine the bulk modulus of elasticity in units of pounds per square foot. But when you're doing C, you can leave the bulk modulus in units of PSI because it's going to be a ratio. So if you're dividing in the numerator and the denominator, you don't have to bother with the units conversion. And the same thing is true with the diameters. You can leave those both in units. You don't have to, units of inches, you don't have to convert it to feet. So it's just here in C prime that you need the E sub V to be as pounds per square foot rather than pounds per square inch. In this second equation for celerity, you can leave it in PSI. So the reason why the shock wave is moving slower through the pipe than it does through just water of infinite extent is remember that the pipe is expanding. And so the expansion of the pipe is taking out some of the energy that otherwise would be propelling that shock wave forward. So it would be going at 4874 feet per second through water without any of that expansion and you're kind of doing work on the pipe as it expands. You know, getting it to change its diameter is effectively uh, applying work to the pipe. So that slows down the velocity of the shock wave as it's moving through the pipe. So in the pipe, it's just 4397 feet per second. By the way, you'll notice that I left PSI in the numerator and the denominator. I just left the diameter in inches, the pipe thickness in inches, and that's OK since it's a ratio in both the numerator and the denominator. So how much will the pressure go up? So the delta P, um, 407 PSI in this example. So it was water that was initially going 6.8 feet per second. And uh, because of that, the pressure increased 58,000 pounds of force per square foot works out to uh, 407 PSI. And then finally, if we want to calculate how long of a time is the minimum close time. That just means that if you close the pipe in less than 0.91 seconds, then it's going to uh, achieve that maximum pressure increase. There's still going to be a pressure increase, though, even if you close it slower. So if you took one second to close the pipe, it's not like you get off scot-free and there's no pressure increase. It's just that the pressure increase is going to be less than that maximum. OK. Any questions about this example? Let me just give you a moment to copy things down if there was anything that you didn't have yet. All right, so um, if you have a, a valve closure time that's greater than that time, so we just calculated the minimum closure time. So if you take longer than that, then the pressure increase would be lower. And this is an empirical formula that just estimates what the pressure increase would be. And you'll see that. It, first of all, you have to calculate this intermediate parameter, n, which is dependent on the length of the pipe, the density of the fluid, the velocity of the water, and then also the, uh, the valve closure time and the initial pressure in the pipe. So all of those things play into this factor n, which is then uh, multiplied 
after some transformation multiplied by the initial pressure and then that would estimate the pressure increase. Um, now the other aspect of this is how to prevent water hammer and the video we watched talked about a water hammer arrestor and it looked like a little shock absorber like maybe you'd see on a car you know like a spring and um, another approach rather than having that spring which absorbs some of the energy and like some of the water volume is entering the space in the arrestor you could just have a tank where the water level uh, increases in the tank instead of having the uh, the pipe expand remember that without a surge tank or an arrestor there's extra water in the pipe and that excess water is causing the pipe to expand and so all of the energy is going into the pipe expanding so if you just provide someplace else for the water to go like a surge tank then the pipe isn't going to expand because it's much easier for the water to enter a surge tank and have the liquid level increase instead of having the uh, the pipe expand and so um, this formula allows you to calculate how deep of a surge tank would be required um, and it's a, a dependent on the velocity of flow the initial flow velocity so what we were just working with the flow velocity was 6.75 feet per second and so if you know the area of the pipe and the length of the pipe then multiplying those two together is going to give you the volume of the pipe and then the uh, the tank cross-sectional area meaning you know it's going to be a function of the the diameter of the tank how tall the liquid level is going to rise in the tank is a fraction of the ratio of the area of the pipe and the tank and then also the initial flow velocity. So this is just a formula that would tell you how tall the tank would be. Uh, since we're out of time, it's 150. We won't go through the calculations on that one, but just so that you're aware, there is a formula for us to calculate how deep the water would get inside of a surge tank. All right, so that's it. Hope you have a great weekend. Remember that your next assignment is due on Wednesday.